Okay, good morning everybody, or good afternoon shall we say. This is going to be our lecture with PHTLS. It's going to be on traumatic brain injuries. Okay, you can follow along in your book. We're going to be jumping around different areas that are going to be in your chapter 8 in your PHTLS book. Okay, and it's going to be getting on page about 258. But let's talk a little bit about the, less, the actual objectives itself of what we're going to be discovering here. We're going to be able to identify the signs and symptoms of the traumatic brain injury. And also we're going to be looking at explaining the pathophysiology behind these traumatic brain injuries as well. And what actually is occurring on inside the brain. We're going to get into the biomechanics of traumatic brain injury as long as the primary and secondary brain injuries that are associated as well. And remember this also, we're going to be demonstrating the proper management of each one of these patients. We're going to actually go through a case, a case scenario. We're going to see a we're going to see a picture of what an injury would look like from somebody that's going to be like a skateboard injury. And then from there, we're going to talk about what we're going to find from there. Okay, so let's think a little bit about right here. Let's, take, let's go ahead and take a look at traumatic brain injuries. When we're looking at it, you know, you see here that it suffers about 10 million people annually throughout the world. Think about 10 million people throughout the world. Okay, that's about 750,000 people uh, per month. And so in the United States alone, we have, what, 2.8 million people that have been affected of annually by a traumatic brain injury of some kind, whether it be a massive hemorrhagic bleed and they suffer permanent brain injury or if it's going to be one that they're going to recuperate from as well. They just, but they do suffer traumatic brain injuries. Of course, it can be very minor to very major. So when you're thinking about this right here as well, that if, when the point of where we're at in this lecture here, by the time that we're done, that every 21 seconds of this lecture, you're gonna, people are going to be suffering from a traumatic brain injury. Now then, along with this right here also, we're going to look at the most frequent causes of death and disability among children in the United States. Now when you think about it, you say, we know that infants fall from about age one month to one year, but when we get into children, it's going to be the one year on, and so roughly around the ages of three or four years of age is when they suffer the most traumatic brain injury because that's when children are often playing outside, you know, they're out there on the swings, they're out there running around, doing whatever else it may be. They're in cars, often may not be seat belted in vehicles. I've had many calls where that has happened as well. So when you think about it, you know, you're going to see different types of things associated with their brain injuries as well. So let's talk a little bit about some of the most common causes of traumatic brain injury. What I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and we're going to turn over to page 265 that's in your books. Okay, and you should be able to see the exact same picture that I have here. But let me talk a little bit about this first of all. When you're, when you're thinking about it specifically with this. Okay, I want us to look at some of the key concepts of this right here before we talk about these different types of these injuries. Okay, when you think about it, it says that most motor vehicle crashes, right, cause almost 60% of traumatic brain injuries across all age groups, whether it's adult, child, or even infant. And some of these largest brain injuries that occur, about 32% of them, believe it or not, are from the age of 5 to 75. So you say to yourself, when does this happen? Think about the process of it. 5 years of age to 75 years of age, often traumatic brain injuries can come from falls. And so that brings us right down to the next thing that we have. 20 to 30% of these are of the patients who are pediatric about four, four years of age, okay? And you're ready for this one, is that remembering this, that when an injury occurs, it's usually double the height of what the person is. So if you have a two, you have a, a four-year-old that's about an average of, say, two and a half to three feet tall, correct? And, they, and that's a pretty tall kid, that if he climbs up a three-foot ladder and he falls, that's double his height and his, and, his, and, and his height itself and the injuries that occur from that. But the interesting part is, is we got violence. Violence is related to 10%, and on equality of that is also going to be workplace, such as like construction sites, whatever else it may be, and also sports-related injuries. Those are also occur for about 10%. So let's focus a little bit on this slide, on this little on this slide that we have up here, okay? That I'm that I'm showing y'all. Go to, and again, look at your book in page 265. We're going to be talking about your different types of herniation. As you can see right here, we got Right here, the uncus is going to be your unical right here. Okay, that's going to be, when you're thinking about it, your book says specifically that this is when you start to see pupillary changes in your patients. 
So cranial nerve number three, correct, which is your oculomotor nerve, that when you have a patient who has an altered mental status, correct, and their pupils have not been affected, then we don't have that bleed that's starting to get that massive bleed that's occurring because when it starts to affect the ocular nerve is when you start to get those unilateral pupils and immediately, of course we all know the unilateral pupils is one is dilated and one is pinpoint but you often wind up having associated with that one is motor weakness on the opposite side and you start to experience some sort of respiratory dysfunction is it as well that may progress to a coma now when you start to experience a respiratory dysfunction it means they start to have abnormal breathing patterns so turn slightly over if you would guys to page 267 in your book and I want you to see the various types of breathing patterns that are associated with the head and brain trauma. We go from a normal breathing pattern of 12 to 20 per minute. We have a taxic breathing, which is going to be a sign of a person who is actually near death. You have bradypnea, which is a slow breathing associated with it, which is often associated with Cushing's triad, correct? You also have the fast breathing often associated with central neurogenic hyperventilation. You have biots breathing as well. Chain stoking often seen in patients who have suffered massive strokes, major bleeds. The brain does not recognize if it's a traumatic related injury or an internal bleed that's occurred from like say a, a ruptured vessel in the brain associated with a stroke. But you often get chain stoke respirations. We'll talk a little bit more about different types of body postures in a little bit. As well as Kussmaul respiration associated with, associated with diabetics. And of course just standard tachypneic type breathing. So when you're looking at this right here, as the brain starts to herniate and things start to occur, you start to get this herniation down the brain, you start to develop a posturing of the patient. So when you look at this right here, it's called central downward or it's called central herniation, which means now the brain itself is starting to swell, it's starting to affect the posturing of the patient. Where the brain is starting to swell, it's starting to hit the foramen magnum, you're starting to get abnormal breathing patterns associated with the swelling around the brain, the medulla, the, the actual pneumotaxic center of the medulla oblongata itself as well, and y'all probably remember that from paramedic school and in the old days of what it may be, but now you're getting this decorticate posturing. And again, the decorticate posturing, and I have, some, I have a slide I'll show you a little bit later on, but remember decorticate posturing is where the arms themselves are going to be curved towards the body. Okay, and what that means is that's the early, that's not actually the brain herniation down to the circle of Willis down the brain stem, this is one of the first signs you're going to actually have a patient with unilaterally dilated pupils, they start having a fast breathing pattern, their arms start getting decorticate because the brain is starting to swell into the point where they have coma. Then as we start to make, then as it starts to come, we're now going to hit the midbrain, which is our next that we're talking about, the cingulate. Okay, when you think about it, it's one of the, it says it's one of the most common innermost parts of the frontal lobe that is scraped across the brain of the of the, of the dura mater itself in the brain, so therefore you now have the two hemispheres of the brain that are being affected. So what you have now is not only do you start having the corticate posturing, you're now going to have to start with your abnormal posturing. Coma is starting to develop as well, and you may actually start to form the cerebrate posturing in your patient as it moves on down and it starts to swell the brain. And then as you're going down through, you now have the, the cerebellar, and you also have the tonsillar as well, which now with the cerebellar, we're now getting into the more likely to do cerebrate posturing. The frame and magnum, the circle of Willis is now pushing down and is pushing on the brain, swelling the brain, the brain cavity, now pushing it down. And you now get the cerebrate posturing with a chain stoke type respiration. Then you actually, at the very end stage of what we're looking at, unfortunately, is we now have the patient who is now here where we're now pushing the brain down the brain stem, as you can see, one, two, three, and four, as we were talking about, it's now pushing down the brain stem, now causing the patient to have a chain stoke type respiration, correct, to a port to where there's an ataxic respiration, and then on top of that, they also now have the cerebrate posturing, and of course, at the very end, of course, there's cardiopulmonary arrest that occurs with your patient. So again, these are just some things to look at the different types of what can actually happen on when you're dealing with herniation syndrome itself and the various descriptions of those herniations. So, again, that's just a brief overview, not to go in too much depth of where it is, but just for you can have an understanding of when you see different types of things, such as with the patients, they don't have unilateral pupils, they just have an altered level of consciousness. 
and then they go from that to having unilateral pupils and depending on which one which one is blown depends on which side of the brain is being affected then they go from there to being an unconscious state with the unilateral pupils to a decorticate type posturing then from that they have a fast breathing pattern associated with it to a decerebrate type posturing where they now have a chain stoke type respiration which is an app which is going to be a flat breathing pattern which is no breathing to a fast erratic breathing pattern and again you often see this associated with with strokes as well because it is a hemorrhagic bleed affecting the brain and pushing down the brain stem you also begin to notice because we're into the actual point of the medulla oblongata which is controlling temperature you start to also have temperature regulations as well with a patient who has suffering brain stem injury related to a decerebrate type posturing so let's go ahead and take a look now at a presentation that we've got here for y'all i want y'all to take a look at this right here if you can focus in on this you're actually going to see what appears to be as a 22 year old male patient who's fallen and if you look at them they've fallen and they've fallen now on this is going to be this is going to be his head right here facing facing that direction that's the back of his leg that's here you can see me falling on that on that shoulder straight down so you say okay his friends will tell you this when you get there that he was trying to do what he was trying to ride the longest down the rail with the patient when he fell so he was trying to do a rail ride and he fell down and, and crashed onto the onto the concrete this is the key right here looking at he struck his hand first so your mind has to start thinking about it, even if you're walking up to the scene before you get there and they're telling you all this while you're on the way to the patient he fell in his hand first you're automatically going to think that he does have some sort of an arm injury is it an open fracture or a closed fracture and the key is this right here also we want to know was he wearing a helmet or not if he wasn't wearing a helmet we have to think about did he suffer traumatic brain injury or if he was wearing a helmet did the helmet protect him well enough that he did not suffer a severe traumatic brain injury so, and look at this right here. Let's think about this right here. What are some things that you need to be concerned with specifically about the physics of trauma for the patient? Well, let's think about it. Okay, we know this right here. He fell approximately what? Maybe, y'all agree, what, probably three, maybe four feet, depending on what it is, if he's standing up on his skateboard. Okay, and you have to think about how fast was he traveling, right? So how fast was he going? So... You know, was he going somewhere between three to five miles an hour? Was it as high as five to ten miles an hour? Because let's face it, on the skateboard in the skate park, you can really be flying on the skateboard. And you have to say, okay, when he fell, how did he land? We saw we saw that he hit his arm, correct, and then he and he also hit his head, correct. And we have to think about what type of other injuries may be associated with. We got to think about cervical spine injuries, think about arm injuries, and what not seeing yet, correct. And so you got to start to begin to think, okay, what may I see a potential head injury? May you have an altered level of consciousness, correct? Whatever else it may be from there. So I got to start thinking about what may have caused this to be, because a normal 22-year-old doesn't have this problem. So you have to think about what surface did he fall on? As we saw in the picture before, he fell on what appeared to be a concrete surface. Okay, so it's not like on dirt. It's not like on grass, correct? He was not going down a down a steep hill. Was just, he was just in a skate park. So you say to yourself, okay. Also, did he have elbow pads on? I didn't see any elbow pads. I don't know if you did or not, but did he have elbow pads on? Did he have something to protect his knees as well? So maybe he suffered other injuries also with that one. So you have to think about these things. So, and you think about what other possible injuries that could he have sustained? Could he have sustained such as maybe facial injuries where he may have broke his jaw? Could it be the fact that he has some sort of a facial fracture? Is he going to have cerebral spinal fluid coming out of his ears? You know, what other type of injuries can you think about that may have occurred such as what neck spine injury so again like we talked about we're going to we're going to definitely main, make sure we maintain c spine no matter what age it is correct correct and then with that also you have to think about like the type of an axial injury right as well as let's think about this right here now you know when you're thinking about it what other type of things may you see correct when you get here to the same size up all right we're going to say okay let's think about this right here what's the likelihood of any other type of axial injury do we have a possibility of do we have any, does he have any hematomas to his head correct does he have some sort of intracerebral hemorrhage am i seeing again am i seeing the signs of a cerebral hemorrhage or first basically just he got concussed and he has a head injury but he has a hard head and he's not suffered any type of cerebral injury to his brain 
And we also have to think about, of course, with his arm. Correct? Do we have a fracture to his arm? All these things are going on in, in our mind or whatever else is going on when you're, say, walking up to the scene. So let's go ahead and do this now. When we get there, we're going to take a look. Let's go ahead and do this right here. You're going to get to the patient. You're going to do this. You've got your scene size up, correct? Scene is going to be safe. You've got the general correction. Your patient is lying prone. He's got a hematoma and abrasion to the right side of the head. Okay, so your brain's going to start to think about that right now. Okay, so now then, before we're going to we're going to get here to the primary survey, correct? And we're going to look at the X. Okay, and then bring it to the next to the next thing we're going to look at with our primary survey. X stands for like exsanguinating. Okay, bleeding of bleeding. We're going to look and say, okay. Think about this picture here, guys. Y'all get a mental picture of it. I know it's a little bit difficult sometimes, and you can't see the patient. But let's think about it. He's got oozing dark red blood from the right side of his head. So when he fell, he did hit the right side of his head. It appears as though he has an open fracture of the right radius and ulna, but we have no active exsanguination. So therefore, we're looking at basically it's a venous type blood. It's not actively spurting blood, so we don't have to think about putting a tourniquet on the arm and the factors of where we actually have a patient who has an open fracture of his right arm and of his right arm. But we do have to think about how we're going to treat that and take care of it when we're managing these secondary injuries. So let's go right here to his airway. So we're going to always move to the ABCDE approach, correct? So we do have a patent. He has no airway obstruction. Your partner, right, like we talked about, your partner is going to be doing what? Performing manual inline stabilization. Okay? So we automatically know he's going to be maintaining over C spine. But now look at his breathing. His breathing has increased to 20 times per minute. But his lung sounds are clear and equal bilaterally, so that we know that we don't have any problem associated with the breathing pattern right now at this point, but that it is slightly increased. Okay, let's take a look at his skin. His skin appears to be pale and warm and dry. So he is pale, so we have to think about that. You know, looking down here, it's going to be a hot day. But also look at his pulse rate. His pulse rate is 100 right now, which does it's not bad considering all things. But however, his SpO2 is 92% and total CO2 is 32 Normally it's going to be what? 35, 45, correct? So now what we have going on is we actually have a patient who has an O2 sat of 92. We've got to think about a 22-year-old oxygen saturation of 92. He's breathing 20 times a minute. His heart beats 100. You say, okay, is there something going on? Well, let's go through and further look at what we've got. He appears to be conscious, but he is confused. So we do have our Glasgow Coma score. Remember we talked about earlier about the head injuries and things like that. He does, let's look at his glaucoma coma score. It's about a 13 right now, so he's got his eye opening is 3, he, his verbal is 4, and he's got a motor function of 6. Okay, so right now we've got some confusion going on. He's able to talk to us, correct? But his pupils are 3 millimeter, but look at what they are right now. They are equal bilaterally, but they are sluggish to what? Respond to light. Okay, so right now, does it appear that we have ourselves a major head injury? Right now, it appears as though we do have a problem. He has been concussed. He does appear to be confused, but we're not showing any internal signs of what we got from what we can physically see at this moment. The outside temperature, as you can see, guys, is going to be about 78 degrees. Not a problem there. Other than his skin is a little bit pale. He's warm and dry. Okay? His skin temperature appears to be normal at this time. The thing is that we're looking at right here, as you can see from the actual lecture slide right here, he does have his right forearm is deformed. He has an open bleeding fracture of the wound there. It is venous bleeding that's coming out, so you can make sure you manage and address that. So, when you're thinking about it, correct, let's go for where we're at, all right? So, do you think there's any need for any type of a hemorrhage control at this point in time? Think about it. Is it arterial bleed? You say, no, it's not. So, do you really need to think about it? It's just hemorrhage control, meaning that you're going to have to apply direct pressure followed up with a tourniquet. Does not appear to be that at this time, correct? It, it, even though it is an open fracture, it is just a bit, little bit of a venous bleed, is what we're looking at. Look at his airway now. Let's take a look at that one, okay, guys? So, hemorrhage control, we're looking pretty good. Airway management, let's discuss it again, all right? It's going to be an O2 sat of 92%, right? So, the patient should have some oxygen as well, right? Because you want to make sure his O2 sat is going to be what at least, remember, 94 to 99 is what we're looking at, so you want to make sure at least 94% or greater. So maybe put on a little bit of low flow oxygen, correct? Maybe nasal cannula, maybe titrated again between 94 to 99, okay? 
So from there, let's think about the C-spine, okay? So in looking at the C-spine, we want to make sure that we're going to have that called the spinal motion restriction, right, the SMR. We're going to make sure we maintain C-spine on the patient because he did hit his head. He's obviously been concussed. He has a Glasgow Coma score of 13. May have a potential head injury inside. We don't know yet. We're not at that point through our assessment. We haven't found anything there to lead us down that travel path. Okay, now then, so you, but you say to yourself, could it be possible this patient could be suffering from a traumatic brain injury? Hmm, let's think about it. Okay, so could it be suffering from a tra traumatic brain injury? Let's think about this here. Did he, do you think that he may have suffered some sort of a secondary impact? So he did hit his head, correct? As you can see here, what each one of the brains are going, what each part of the brain is going to be associated with. And if you guys will go ahead and do for me a favor and turn over to page 260 in your books, okay, you're going to actually see the same picture that I'm looking at in case you cannot see it on the slide. And you got table 8-1 is also going to be, it's going to also be talking about that as well. So let's go ahead and look at the different areas of the brain that we have. We, of course, we have the cerebrum itself, correct, which, which, which helps us to have the functions of what? Sensory function, motor function, intelligence, and memory. Of that one, we can see that we're specifically talking about, we have the frontal portion of the brain. And let's think about what the frontal portion of the brain is going to be talking about. This is where we're dealing with what? Emotions, motor function, correct? Expressions, speech, right? Your dominant side, whatever it may be. All right, so let's go ahead with the parietal. Where's the parietal region at, guys? Y'all can see it right here. If you're looking and following along in your book as well on page 260, it's going to be your green section as well. And that's going to be sensory function and your spatial orientation, correct? Numbers, everything else, what it may be. So now we've got sensory function. So he does not appear to have any tingling or anything at all that we can see that we've been associated with. But we are looking right here now about the temporal. So where's our temporal lobe? Temporal lobe is right here, correct? So right here we've got purple that's going to be in your book as well, okay? And it's this right here, if you look at it in your in Table 8-1, it talks about the temporal is, of course, the regulation of certain memory functions, speech reception, correct? It's all like right-handed. It's all, it's all the right-handed, and the majority of left-handed individuals helps us to make that determination from where we are. So these are, some, these are things you may not think about exactly at the time, but it's just kind of want to cover this so you can start to think about these different things. We're now going to get down to the factors of what? The occipital region. Occipital, remember that we're dealing with traumatic brain injuries. We talked about the cranial nerve number three, correct? With that one specifically, this is where you may start to see vision changes with the pupillary responses indicating the factors of some sort of a TBI. We also have the cerebellum. Cerebellum being down here on the back side of the brain, looking at that right there, this has to deal with movement. So if a person says, I can't move my legs, I can't. That's more so a spinal injury, but now this is about, sir, can you squeeze my hands? Can you pick up your arm? Do they have purposeful movement or do they push away from you? You know, whenever you, do they have non-purposeful movement whenever you're, you're trying to get them to do a certain response with you? Then we have brain stem. Look at what your brain stem does. So right here, we're dealing specifically with the brain stem, the pons and the medulla, correct? Right there, when you're dealing with brain stem, there's a, it's the relay between the brain and the spinal cord. So this right here is basically, this is your depot where everything starts. Everything feeds through here, goes down to the brain, goes through the brain stem, comes back up. This is where all the signals travel and pass right through right here. Okay, down your spinal cord. You got, the, you got your midbrain, okay? You have your midbrain as well when you're thinking about your midbrain. When you're thinking about that one, it's also, this is related to if a person is easily aroused, are they alert, correct? This right here is going to be your... Your RAS system, which is your reticular activating system as well. So when you think about that, we have the pons right here. Here's the pons. So what do the pons do? Y'all look at your book there for a second and tell me about and we'll think about the pons. Okay? This right here is when you talk, when we look at it, we've already discussed it a little bit, is the respiratory portion, the part of the brain. Correct? This has to do with what? Convey signals from the cerebrum, the, the medulla, the cerebellum, everything else falls right through the pond. But the key point is right here. This is your respiratory apnea center, which means respiratory centers are controlled. Okay, so when you start thinking about a person starting to experience a massive TBI that affects the medulla area, 
the medulla, the medulla oblongata, everything else. When this starts to get too affected, you know that the brain is starting to swell. You know that you have a problem because now you're starting to get abnormal breathing patterns. Okay, and then of course now the medulla deals with what cardiopulmonary, such as breathing and heart rate. So now when we're here and we're talking about even Cushing's triad, you know when you're talking about the breathing pattern of the patient, when you're talking about the pulse and the blood pressure, correct? When you're looking at those, now we're dealing with the factors of, okay, now we're affecting cardiac function, we're affecting your actual respiratory function as well. So just in thinking about that, guys, just as a kind of little of a brief overview here for us to be thinking about. So we have to say, okay, when we're thinking about a secondary impact of, of our patient, we have to think about as practitioners, correct, did somebody suffer a major traumatic brain injury from this? We have to think about hypoxia, correct? Which we know applies to every patient who has an altered level of consciousness. If, they're all, if their consciousness is altered, they may potentially have some sort of a lack of oxygen, such as our patient here, with an oxygen saturation of 92%, okay? Are they hypoventilating? Are they hyperventilating? Do I have an airway obstruction? When they hit their head, was it, did, they, were they, did they have alcohol on board? Could be a potentiation of something related to that, correct? Was, and if I have hypotension with a patient with a head injury, correct, is there some other type of bleed that may be going on as well? So these are some things that we absolutely need to think about at this point. So let's think a little bit now about cerebral blood flow. Okay, we're thinking about it. Remember this right here, it says, the brain needs a constant flow of blood to do what? In order to have oxygen, glucose to the brain and where it is. So let's think about this right here. Remember this, that the patient's blood pressure, when it decreases, cerebral perfusion pressure will also decrease. So when cerebral perfusion pressure decreases, correct, remember what happens here, the blood vessels in the brain begin to dilate. When they dilate, what do we have? We now have more blood flowing into a confined space of the skull. This is what often leads to your intracranial pressure. Okay, so when you're thinking about that, that's what leads to your intracranial pressure. Okay, so we have to think about those things. So when we're, so we're dealing with this, we have to say to ourselves, correct, about the airway management. Is it important to a patient with, with a traumatic brain injury? Absolutely. We have to think about this right here. Does this oxygen saturation, does it tell us anything? Correct. What do we need to do for the airway management? What's his end title CO2 about specifically about this patient? Well, let's look at it here a little bit more in depth and detail. We talked a little bit about the hypoxia versus hyperoxia. We want to make sure that with a patient with a traumatic brain injury, you saw that, you know, when, was, when do you ever put a traumatic brain in, when do you put a patient who has suffered a traumatic injury, you put him on a nasal cannula versus a normal breather, you're always like, put him on some high flow O2, high flow O2, high flow O2. Well, think about what's going on now. We want to make sure we maintain an O2 sat of 94 to 99, correct? Remembering that irreversible brain damage can occur within about four to six minutes, correct? From an arterial bleed that is going to be in the brain. So what we need to think about is, is that where we're dealing with the patient, when his O2 sat is around lower than 94, we need to make sure that we bring it up to 94. We don't want to make sure that we go too high with his oxygen level, okay? It says, think about this right here, because too much oxygen delivery can cause hyperoxia which can worsen the outcome of the patient, okay, when you think about it. Because right now, think about where we're at. He's, already, he's breathing 20 times a minute, so we know, his O2, we know his entitled CO2 is going to be like around, what's around 32, correct? But he's also got a problem with his, O2, with his oxygen saturation is a little bit low. So therefore, we have to be very cognizant of that factor, even when we're dealing specifically with his breathing status. We're going to talk a little bit more about later on as well. So you want to make sure that it, the ventilatory rate is between 10 to 20, correct? In tidal CO2, roughly between 35 to 40 as well. But just making sure that with your airway management, you want to look at there and say, okay, even though it is a traumatic patient, correct? And what we have going on, do we need to put him on a high flow O2? Do we need to put him on a low flow O2? Do we need to make sure we monitor his, make sure we monitor his respiratory rate, correct? Making sure his respiratory rate is starting to experience and go high. Are we getting near the point of a person as it increases above 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40, is he starting to develop a central neurogenic hyperventilation associated with a head injury? Start checking the pupillary responses. If you start seeing the sluggish pupils, you start seeing one become more pinpoint 
Then the other one, you start seeing an ultra level of consciousness. You start to see his boss coma scale drop down from 13 to even less. So these are some things that we absolutely that we absolutely need to think about. Okay. So I want you guys to look over on page 260 in your book. You're going to see this right here dealing specifically with cerebral perfusion pressures. Okay. Right here, when we're looking at it, we just want to make sure we got a couple of things we're just going to cover here, not get too much depth or detail. Remember that when we're dealing with a cerebral perfusion pressure, we're also thinking about with cerebral perfusion pressure, intracranial pressure as well. You know, we're thinking about the factors of, with adults. Their inner cerebral perfusion pressure is usually below about 15 or so. Children about three, to, three to seven, about one, to, about 1.5 to six as well in kids. We want to think. The reason why I'm bringing this up is, is that we can't see this in the field, but yet there are some things that we can begin to see based on what we see from physical findings, such as are we dealing with a patient with an epidural bleed, a subdural bleed, a subarachnoid bleed? We don't have all the abilities to take and put in and measure what the actual cerebral perfusion pressure is going to be, but we, however, we can see different things going on based on where the injury or where the bleed may actually occur in the brain itself. Okay, so when we're thinking about it, how, again, how would you manage this initial patient's oxygen needs? We talked about it already, correct? You're going to say, okay, is O2 saturation, you want 94 to 99, right? Optimal. And if your nasal cannula is not sufficient, could you move to a normal breather mask? Is that possible? Yeah. And it also, if that didn't work, to maintain those oxygen saturation levels that you may need to have, you may actually need to bag your patient as well. When you're thinking about your spinal motion restriction, correct? You want to think about, okay, what do I have to do here? How am I going to be able to manage the patient's airway? What do I need to think about? I'm going to put the seat collar on. I want to make sure that it's not too tight. Making sure that you properly immobilize your patient. You're going to, you're going to then also, you're going to maintain the patient's airway, his ventilatory status, his circulatory status, especially if he's a severe traumatic injury of a patient, and you're dealing with a patient who is also has a hypotensive problem related to a traumatic brain injury, which often causes your blood pressure to what? Rise versus your blood pressure to fall. So if you have a patient with a traumatic brain injury itself that is suffering extreme hypotension, you need to start thinking about other injuries that are internal injuries associated. So let's take a little bit more depth and detail here. Let's look at this right here. Remember I talked about previously in the previous slide on page 260, if you can refer to your book while I'm on this slide, you'll now see here we talked about what different types of brain injuries that we have. We have concussions, brain contusions, intracranial hemorrhages now. So we go from a concussion to a brain contusion, correct, like a coup contra coup type injury, to an epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, intracerebral, correct, cerebral laceration, diffuse axial injuries as well. So let's talk a little bit about these a little bit more in detail, is that with your epidural bleeds, when you're thinking about it, correct, your primary injury of an epidural bleed, what are some things that you think that it may be located in? Well, remember this right here is that with an epidural bleed, just as a brief overview, it's going to be basically between your skull and your dura mater. So looking at your picture, if you would please, you can see that the epidural bleed is between the skull and the dura mater. Let's go to the subdural bleed. When you look at the subdural bleed, it's going to be between your subdural space, if you can see on your picture please, at page 260 if you'll follow along, and then it's going to be right there between the subdural space and the dura mater, right, right with the arachnoid matter. Then you have the subarachnoid, correct? If you see the arachnoid matter, you're going to have the subarachnoid, which is going to be beneath the arachnoid matter. Okay, so then you also have your intracerebral bleeds as well when you're dealing with those, along with what else? Cerebral laceration, right? Lacerating the actual cerebrum itself, correct? And then, of course, you have the diffuse axial injury, correct? Your diffuse axonal injury, which is what associated with what? This is literally, okay guys, listen to this one here. It literally shears, the me it's a shearing mechanism, right, with the disruption of the gray, and the gray matter and the, and the actual white matter. You actually have a shearing effect of what's going on in the brain. So, with a skull fracture, correct, we just have the injury to the brain's protective casing, right, indicates what? Significant force, right? Not a big deal. From there, just significant force that hits the brain. You can see right over here with the CT scan. Suggest there might be an injury to the spine and to the brain as well, okay? You may want to start thinking about, do I have 
with this type of an injury, with a skull fracture, do I actually start to notice a type of signs and symptoms associated with a patient to, to be suffering a TBI? Okay, a traumatic brain injury associated with it. Do it does the, is the hematoma going to cause the patient? Maybe there may be a, maybe a fracture. Maybe it ruptured part of these different the matters of the brain, causing it to be a traumatic brain injury and bleed. So when you think about it, correct? They're often associated with what? They have with a cerebral concussion. They often have what? Amnesia, correct? What did the brain didn't have enough to impact with it to, and cause a brain stem contusion as well? When you're thinking about it. Okay, so now then, what are some symptoms of the concussion? Look at this right here, guys. They stare off into space, verbal motor responses. They have confusion, inability to focus. That's what our patient had, correct? A little bit of confusion, so you can see where confusion falls. Disoriented, speech may be a little bit slurred, correct? Speech may be a little bit incoherent. This, again, is a concussion, not a bleed, right, at this point in time. They may not want to cooperate with you very much. They may have a problem with what? Their emotions. They may be extremely erratic, may be extremely combative, right? They have memory problems, inability to focus, right? Then we have what we, what we have going on now is we have different types of what? Hematomas that are associated with it, correct? And what do we have here? We have what is known as the epidural bleed, correct? So we're dealing with the epidural bleed. We have epidural, subdural, and the intracerebral bleed. So let's look at the epidural bleed right here for just a few moments. As you can see, we're now between what? When we're dealing with it, we already talked about, right? We're at the dura matter now for the skull we talked about earlier when I had us when I was looking at what we were focusing on on page 260. This patient right here now, signs and symptoms of the epidural bleed and the subdural bleed. So let's focus on this right here. We're going to talk, he often has signs of what? Signs and symptoms associated with the loss of consciousness. Correct? They had the lucid interval where the patient actually was a, they got hit in the head. Let's try like a person hit in the head like our man that we had here. Hit in the head, correct? And therefore they had a point where they were conscious, correct? They were unconscious and now they're conscious again whenever, they, whenever you get on the scene of the call. They actually have a point of where they may actually have a headache, right? You may actually begin to develop a dilated pupil on one side. So start to notice that. Okay, now we're starting to get into the bleed factors of what may be going on, correct? You may actually start to even notice even weakness on one side, paralysis on one side of the body as well. Dealing with the subdural, correct? We're talking about the subdural bleeds. We're now looking a little bit different here because of where it's located at, correct? In this portion of the brain, as we discussed earlier. And this right here is, of course, now you have, this is not more so a arterial bleed like it is with epidural. It's going to be more so a venous bleed. And this right here is, again, between your dura matter and your arachnoid matter. But now it's not so much going to have this fast response in the patient. It's going to be more of a slower response from the patient. It may actually take hours, days, weeks to occur. Such as if he fell and he's perfectly fine now, and then you get a call, a 911 call, or someone else gets a 911 call for this same patient several hours later, and he's now experiencing these altered level of consciousness, unilaterally dilated pupils, starts to develop posturing associated with it, decorticate versus decerebrate posturing. So you have to think about those things. The pupils are now having irregular responses. You may actually experience even seizures, even the point of paralysis on one side of the body. The intracerebral hematomas. This is, again, just a bruising, right? Hematoma of the blood. But now these patients right here may experience what? Headache, nausea, vomiting, correct? They may have increased intracranial pressure, okay? But they often associate with some sort of a vasospasm that might be with it, okay? So we just got to think about that we're beginning to look at patients with maybe an intracerebral type hematoma. Nothing that's major that can be going on that we can see from a massive bleed. Then we're following now the diffuse actual injuries. I mean, we talked about that, that, just that shearing effect that we're talking about. It's the actual shearing of the nerve cells themselves right across the cerebral cell or vellum, correct? And of course, notice here, your patients can have that loss of consciousness, that increased ICP like we were talking about. And remembering, Right here, guys, and we're looking at our books from earlier that we were discussing, is that the ocular nerve, the nerve number three, is the reason why we start to have the unilaterally dilated pupils with your patient. Okay? The key is I want you guys to remember this, is that even though, again, like we talked about the symptoms, is the loss of consciousness and increased ICP, there really is no specific treatment for this injury. 
okay? No specific treatment at all that, that is noted. But let's do this. Let's continue on with our case progression that we got for our patient here. So, what is the condition of our patient now? What kind of brain injury might the patient have? Let's look at this right here. Let's come a little bit more in detail. So we know for sure that we had oozing dark blood from the right side of his head, okay? The patient was talking. He was confused. So start thinking about now from what we've covered. He's confused. So does he have, does he have a brain bleed or does he have a concussion? Remember the concussion, right? We talk about the concussion of the brain. We don't see any airway obstruction, correct? We got manual stabilization going on because of potential right spot for spinal motion restriction. He's breathing about 20 times a minute, a little bit faster than normal, but his lung sounds are clear, so which is good, right? His skin is pale, warm and dry, pulse rate's about 100, so the heart rate's going up a little bit, right? Not massively fast, blood pressure's not dramatically changing, respiratory rate's not dramatically dropping down to a slow breathing pattern. His O2 sat's 92, okay, and it can be related to the fact, okay, his O2 sat's 92, but now we got his entitled CO2 is 32, so he's breathing a little bit fast, a little bit of, he's got a little bit of a hypoxia going on, correct? So, but yet he's got breathing pattern fast going on, potentially maybe head injury, your brain's thinking along that way, I hope, all right? If you're thinking about all the variables that are going on, correct, depending on your, depending on your knowledge, your level of care, and what you're, you know what you're able to for your certification processes for each one such as EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic, doctor, nurse, whatever it may be. And so with this the patient appears to be conscious but he is confused. We talked about confusion, right? Associated with all variable ones including concussion. Glasgow coma scale is 13, right? What we had remembering that right there is pupils remember they were three millimeter, they were equal. So we do not have the cranial nerve number three has not been affected yet, oculomotor nerve not been affected yet. Okay, so therefore, outside temperature still looks pretty good. Skin, skin temperatures are relatively normal. We don't have any abnormal temperatures on the patient. Okay, so then, and we can, and just the open fracture of the arm, right? So, what kind of an injury do you think he might have? What's your thought processes? Do you think that maybe he may have a possible brain injury that may be developing? Correct? Let's think about it. So you guys sit there and y'all, we're going to think about this for a couple of minutes here. From what you've seen, from where we're at, correct, do we have, and I'm going to back up these slides right here for a second. We're dealing with actual brain injuries and concussions, correct, and we're going down the, the pipeline of brain injuries, right? Does he have a vacant stare? This is a concussion, right? Does he have verbal motor responses, disorientation? Do we have slurred speech associated with it? Do we have that? Correct? Hmm. Do we have a lack of coordination on what we've had? Have we seen anything with that right there? Does he have a problem with a memory problem recalling? Does he have a bleed problem such as with the epidural? Does he have a loss of consciousness with a lucid interval? Right? Is he experiencing a headache? Or is pup does he have a dilated pupil on the side of the injury? Right? No, his pupils were equal. Okay? Does he appear to have maybe a subdural type thing? Correct? A subdural injury where it dilated pupils on the side of the injury and now this is more so a venous versus an epidural. He didn't have a lucid interval where he was conscious and alert. He went unconscious and now he's awake, right? Does he have any type of paralysis or weakness? Nothing's been associated through his, you know, through his head to toe survey that we did on him, correct? Does he appear to have an intracerebral type hematoma, right? Which could be a, so does he have any type of a headache or nausea vomiting? We've not seen any of that at all, okay? so. So when thinking about it, you know, and of course even you have to think about your di 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 diffuse axial injury as well, okay? So when you're thinking about each one of these right here, we're going, okay, you know, with where he's at, what may it possibly, what may it possibly be, correct? What could it possibly be? So let's think. We got the spinal mobilization on him. We got O2 going on him, correct, from where we're at there specifically, right? So we've got that going on. So you start your IV on him, got IV access. You start your secondary survey. You note the patient is no longer talking to you. Hmm. What do we do there? Patient's no longer talking to you. What are you going to do? What's your thought processes? 
What's your thoughts? Hmm. Think about it now. Patient has a laceration to the right side of the temple. He's got what appears to be a depression of the skull. His pupils left is three millimeters. His right is five. It is now non-reactive. His neck, there's no step-offs or pain. Lung sounds are clear. Abdomen is soft and non-tender. There's no masses, no massive bleeds. Pelvis appears to be intact. Okay. Extremities neurologic. Patent, open fractured, right distal. The keys we're starting to look at now, do you think we're dealing with some sort of a bleed? His pupils are left three millimeter, right is five millimeter. Okay. Let's think about that now. And so, think about that for just a second. Do we, are, do you have a patient who's suffering a concussion or a possible bleed? Remember, we're now, now we're affecting cranial nerve number three. Now we're moving down the factors. Do we have a possibility? Do we have, do we possibly have an epidural bleed, a subdural bleed? What, what may, what may it possibly be? So as we're going down through there, I want you to see this now, where we're at. Got blood pressure on your patient, 168 over 112. He's hypertensive. Okay, heart rate's what? Look at his heart rate now. Anybody see that? 56. What was the heart rate before, guys? Think about it. If you can't remember it, I'll tell you. It's about 100. O2 sat's now gone from 92 down to 90. Now I want you to see something right here, guys. Remember we talked about his temperature was normal? What are we thinking about now? Remember I talked about what part of the brain bleed is going to be when the patient starts having the slow breathing pattern? Remember it's affecting what? The medullary? Pushing down the brain stem, down the circle of down the circle of Willis. We now have what appears to be a respiratory rate of 10, correct? Heart rate is 56, O2 sat is 90, and now we got this in, got an increase of entitled CO2 because the respiratory rate is 10. Blood pressure is dramatically rising. Temperature is now 101. We now have a temperature change. We're now affecting this right here. We have to think about what is now going on. Okay, should we? avoid episodes of hypoxemia. Would you agree? What do y'all think about this? Should we avoid episodes of hypoxemia? Should we allow the patient to become hypoxic? We want to main, we don't want hyperoxia, not hypoxemia, but remember what the things we have going on. You don't want to fast breathe the patients, correct? Because if you do, you can actually cause an increase in your cranial pressure, right? Because you get dilation, it causes more of the blood to flow into the brain. So it's a very, very strategic very strategic that we have to be very careful with this patient. Okay? So, and looking at these eyes right here, so again, looking at these eyes right here, what do we see? Do we see on the pupils? What do they indicate? Okay? Do we see quality of the, of the pupils here? Do we see pinpoint pupils here? Do we see what appears to be unilaterally dilated pupils here in D? Do we appear in B? Do we see the same size pupils there? We have to think about what is going on with the patient. Are they suffering a head injury? And again, in looking back at this patient that we saw, look at his pupils. Left is three millimeters, right is five millimeters. So we definitely, you think we're definitely dealing with a head injury? We now are starting to look at this right here. No pain, lung sounds are clear and equal, soft and non-tender. Patient has still the open fracture, but now we see the depression of the skull. And again, going back to this right here, O2 sats 90, respiratory rate is 10. Is respiratory rate is 10. Let's not forget that we're dealing with, when we're dealing, we think we're dealing with a traumatic brain injury. For adults, we don't want the respiratory rate to be, to be any more than 10. With pediatrics, we don't want it to be any more than 20. And with infants, we don't want it any more than 25. So we may, so with potential, what we're seeing, we're seeing this effect go on right here. We got the pupillary response that we're dealing with now, correct? So you ask yourself, what most likely is happening with our brainwave activity, right? Do you think that we're suffering a, t a, a traumatic brain injury, or, t or TBI as we refer to it? Do I have swelling and herniation? Would you think that we do? What type of a, what may be now causing the patient to become unconscious? Could it be an epidural bleed due to that open fracture of the brain? Could it be an accidental injury that could be caused from just striking his head and get that coup contra coup injury? Right, causing, causing, the act, causing it to shear in his brain, correct? The nerves to shear. So you have to think about yourself, what is going on with the patient? So 
How does this right here, how does the mass affect the present in the brain injury of the patient? What do y'all think? How does the mass affect a brain injury patient? How does it affect them? The mass. When you think about the mass, you think about the mass of the brain and what's going on and how it does affect the patient. What about the hematoma? Can this tell you anything that's going on? The amount of pressure that's been exerted on the brain, correct? Does the patient appear to be having an internal brain injury associated with a bleed? He's now unconscious. He was confused. He now has unilaterally dilated pupils. Slowly, does he have a, does he have a bleed that's occurring? Do we go, are we going to start noticing some sort of a posturing? We're going to start noticing some sort of a shift in the brain that we're now going to go from maybe a, just an unconscious with a unilaterally dilated pupil. Are we going to start to develop posturing, such as decorticate posturing, correct? Which is more so a higher brain injury with with central neurogenic hyperventilation, or is it going to be more so a lower brain injury down to the brain stem causing the cerebrate posturing to occur, or abnormal extension compared to abnormal flexion, which is also going to cause a chain stoke type breathing pattern. So let's think about it. Here's what we got. The triad phenomenon, correct? We do have that slow pulse. We got that blood pressure, correct? We got that respiratory rate, right? Heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure. Look what we have going on. We have bradycardia. We have hypertension. We have an alteration of the ventilatory pattern that's going on. We already discussed the chain stoking. Here again, this is your decorticate posturing. Look right here where we're at. And we're talking specifically about that. If you can't see it, if you can't see that very well, refer to page 266 in your books for me, okay guys? 266. Alright? And you'll see it in there on page 266. This is more so the higher brain. Decorticate posturing, right? Central neurogenic hyperventilation. To where as they're getting worse, they start to develop this. You're going to see the patient go from this. You, I've actually physically seen a patient go from decorticate posturing, and I've actually seen it herniate down the brainstem to where I actually saw their arms go from here and start to turn to where their arms were now flexing out, correct? And now they have what well, they started chain stoking on us, correct? And started having the abnormal breathing pattern on the patient, and therefore they went from this to this in a matter of just a matter of a few minutes. So again, this is your Cushing's triad syndrome that you're seeing with your patient. Do not forget bradycardia, hypertension, and of course abnormal breathing patterns. So again, you have the asymmetric pupils, the dilated non-reactive pupils, your posturing, your neurologic sense, your neurological deterioration, such as now the patient went from a Glasgow coma of 13 and is moving down the patient's status where Glasgow coma score less than 8 from where we're at. Okay, so you need to think about these things, all right? So, your target is what? Here's the key remembering. Entitled CO2, 35 to 45. It says here, adult ventilatory rate not to exceed what? 20 breaths per minute. Your book talks about keeping it 10. Child is, no, is normally no more than 25. If it's under one year, it's going to be 30. Okay, that's the hyperventilation, that's the mild hyperventilation target that you're, that you're looking at. With your secondary brain injuries, you have to think about hypotension, hypoxia, correct? Cerebral edema, increased ICP and the signs and symptoms of that. Your intracranial infection that may occur, which we can't see, and they also start to have seizure activity. I've seen some seizure activity with patients depending on what type of brain injury that they've been associated with, correct? More so I've seen it more so with like your decorticate type posturing versus the cerebrate type posturing, correct? Because depending on the actual injury that we're talking about. So again, so as a practitioner, what do you think that you should be looking for as a practitioner? Think about it for a minute, please. So secondary brain injuries, again, talking about it. And what injuries do the patient in this, the, this case study may actually have? So let's think about that. When you're dealing with your secondary brain injuries, right, during transport, right, as opposed to the primary injury, of course, you know, you've got the unconscious patient, the unilaterally dilated pupils. They may appear to be posturing, correct? You've got to start dealing with the hypotensive factors that's going on with your patient. How do you treat the hypotension? How are you going to make sure that you maintain that without giving them too much fluids to allow the patient to suffer a worse brain injury? How are you going to ventilate this patient? Are you dealing with the hypoxia versus what? The cerebral edema. So you got to think about, okay, the brain is swelling. I've got a hypoxic state of the patient. I've got to maintain that so I don't get them hyperoxic, right? So I've got to watch that about getting hyperox hyperoxia, 
right? Which that then can cause what? The dilation, causing the brain to further swell, right? You got to start thinking about how I'm going to treat the patient if they start to if they have a seizure associated with this one, correct? And then along with that one, you got to think about okay, maybe if they're on medications of some kind, is it possible that it, they could be on some side of a, some sort of an anticoagulant, right? Or an antiplatelet? And now we're dealing with even more because if it's an older patient who may be on some sort of an anticoagulant or antiplatelet type medication because they may have had a, they may have suffered some sort of a maybe like a patient who may have atrial fibrillation, correct? Where they try to give them an anticoagulant, right, to keep the keeps it from causing to have a stroke type injury related to an ischemic type stroke. Now you're dealing with a lot of associated secondary injuries that may be associated with this, with the primary of the head injury. So, look at this right here. We're going to progress with the case a little bit more. We'll be closing out here in just a few minutes, guys, okay? We notice here the bleeding is controlled, of course. The airway is maintained, nasal airway, bag valve mask device, looking good. We're bagging the patient a little bit, right? Breathing maintained through mild hyperventilation, right? The key is this right here, remembering your book talks about 10, 20, and 25 is with that one specifically, correct? But however, with what we're talking about here, so again, as you can see right here, and remember like I say, I was talking about before, your book talked about 10 for adults, 20 for pediatrics, and then 25 for infants. Look what we have here. Keeping the ventilatory rate about 20 breaths per minute, we got to watch the capnography, right? Making sure it's between 30 to 35. Remember before he was at 32? We're about 30 to 35 as opposed to 35 to 45, right? Maintaining the lungs are clear. Look at his blood pressure. We currently have right now what? Blood pressure is 168 over 90, so we've got a hypertensive situation going on. Patient's color does start to improve, which is good, right? Because we're trying to maintain that. But we don't want to go too high with the ventilatory support, correct? So we're looking at it's going to be one breath about every three seconds or so. And the pulse rate is 56. It's strong, regular, which is good, right? So it's not irregular, so we're not dealing with a patient with atrial fibrillation, which we can probably then rule out some sort of anticoagulant related to atrial fibrillation, if, depending on their age. And then we have our neurological exam. Look at what it's got now. Our gloss calcoma score is now down to five, which means his eye opening is one, verbal is one, and his motor is three. We have and nothing else related to change other than we remember we saw that we had a patient who's now going to be hyperthermic versus normal thermic, what we had earlier. So again, this is our case progression. So as you're going now en route to the hospital, you can see you did complete your secondary survey, right? You're going to transport the patient to what? The closest level one trauma center, head injury, right? They're going to get a CT scan on the patient. Notice what they saw. In dealing with what we've got, we're going to think about the patient with our, with our epidural bleed. So you ask yourself, is it with a potentiation of this patient that actually had an epidural bleed, when you're thinking about it, correct, what did you see? Did he have this? Let's recap it here for just a second, okay? Epidural bleed, large hematoma through a CT scan. Let's re recollect our thoughts here on this one here for the epidural bleed. The patient had a loss of consciousness. The patient had a point of a lucid interval, right? Followed by a loss of consciousness. We never knew that at all, right? But he deteriorated to being unconscious. He did have a dilated pupil on the one side that was affected. No seizure associated with it. So again, we had this sudden massive onset. The reason why we were leaning down the pathway of what appears to be an epidural bleed is because remember we talked about that with a subdural bleed, it's often very slow in nature. It sometimes may take hours, days, or weeks to follow. So when you have that rep, when you have that point of where it appears to be the patient is conscious, and now they're developing to a point of unconsciousness, the pupils are unilaterally dilated while you're there with them in the presence of, the, of this 911 emergency that you have responded to, and the patient is now unconscious, they're starting to have posturing, you have to think that this is not a venous bleed, but some sort of an arterial bleed. That's the key that you have to remember, okay? Whether subarachnoid or epidural, it's an arterial bleed that you're dealing with because they have that, that you're there with them, they go unconscious now. So you have to think about that right there from that standpoint. Okay? So, in looking at where we're at specifically, you know that after surgery, the patient was admitted to where? Trauma ICU for what? For continuing care. So, now then, from where we're at, we're going to look at right here. 
We have the disability assessment to, to identify what? The potential life-threatening injuries of our patient. Did you see anything at all? Correct? Right? Did you see anything at all with where you were at? Y'all think about this for a moment, okay? Did you see did you see a disability on your disability assessment? Did you see a progressive getting worse? Yes. Right? What is your best management of the patient? You saw what did we do? We started giving oxygen, ventilating, correct? We knew the pulse rate was slow, the blood pressure was extremely hypertensive, the patient was hyperthermic, correct? We maintained our we maintained our entitled CO2 between what? 30 to 35, right? Where we were at, maintaining good oxygen saturation on it, but not hyperoxia, not hypoxia, but it's a very fine balance. Okay, and then of course you're just going to have to treat what you find your, on your reassessment. You're going to have to try to fix what you find. If the patient becomes extremely hypotensive related to the head injury, then know that with Cushing's triad, if it's getting worse and the, and the patient's blood pressure starts to fall, then you know you have some other underlying problem. It's just not an isolated head injury that we have associated with it. Okay, so let's wrap it up. All right. The thing is we don't remember guys right here, it's important for us as practitioners to do what? Recognize the signs and symptoms of a TBI, traumatic brain injury, right? Make a sound decision is what you're doing, right? Make sure that what you're doing is that you're just doing what? You're maintaining the patient's oxygen, but you're not perfusing the brain injury, whether it's primary or secondary, which means we don't give too much because if we give too much, we can make them worse by causing what to occur the dilation of the vessels of the brain, therefore increasing the injury. So vitally important. There's nothing any worse for than you to think about if you did something that could cause a further injury of this patient. So again, the key is this right here, making sure you transport them to the closest appropriate facility. And if this one right here, of course, was a level one trauma center that he was taken to, the patient did get, this, get the care that was needed, and they did not suffer any abnormal effects from what we have. So, in cap, in cap, in, in finishing up with what we're talking about is, is remember that with a traumatic brain injury, look at what's going on with the patient. If you start to suddenly notice a deterioration of the patient's symptoms, they don't just stay confused. They don't just stay with a confused state of condition. You start to notice that I'm now reassessing my patient. Their pupil, they're starting to breathe a little faster than what they were at 20. He's now up to 25 or 30. I'm now looking to reassessing his Glasgow coma scores. They're getting worse. Does he start to suffer or does she start to have unilaterally dilated pupils? Is it dilated on the side that's being affected? Do I not start to notice paralysis on one side when I'm trying to get them to do my motor function with me? Remember your pulse motor sensory is on your patients. Then all of a sudden do they go unconscious? Are they staying conscious the whole time? If it's something that you experience, lead yourself down that path that is specifically going to be what? A major bleed that's occurring in the brain that we need to address relatively quickly we want to make sure that we don't give them too much ventilatory support. Make sure you maintain that. Make sure you read your books. Study that part in your book for me, if you would, guys. When we're done with this right here, I want you to go over and really look at, from page 282, 283, and 284 on to the end during the transport that you have of your patient is what you need to do. Because you're going to see some things that you need to do in maintaining airway, breathing, and circulation. But, but luckily this patient right here did not suffer any deleterious side effects from what they had. And of course the patient in our wrap up is meaning that the fact is that the patient has now been taken care of and that's what we're going to be doing right now. So thank you guys for being here as a part of the actual head injury lecture and I hope that you have received something from this in the lecture portion today.